of course, I'm glad that you decided to join us this morning. If you're here for the first time, we have connection cards or our If you would just uh, fill that out and place it in an offering plate, that gives us information about yourself, and I hope that reach back out to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, uh, just thank you for this new year, Lord. Lord, uh, and all the excitement that comes with the new year, Lord. Lord, I just pray that just during this hour, Lord, that we would just give you all the honor and all the praise and all the glory, Lord. And Lord, uh, just thank you for all that you do for us, Lord. Lord, I pray for uh, Pastor Danny as he gets the message, Lord. May your word speak to our hearts, Lord, and may it change us, Lord. And may we just not be just hearers of your word, but doers of your word, Lord. Lord, thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Happy New Year. I was just talking to Annette, and she was like, best way to start out the year is at church this morning. So I'm glad you're here. We're going to sing some great songs of praise this morning. So would you please stand as we sing to God be the glory. To God.
welcome. Happy New Year to you as well. We have been, over the last month, talking about, asking you to pray about, giving toward our Lottie Moon International Mission Offering for Christmas. Hopefully you've already done that. If not, hopefully the Lord's laid something on your heart that you would give above and beyond. It would be an offering, not your tithe, above and beyond what you would typically give to the church to help spread the gospel message abroad. Let me direct your attention to the video monitors. We have one more Lottie Moon offering video we'd like you to see. We don't see points on a map. They aren't just places to us. We see stories of lives living without the hope found in Jesus. Today, somewhere between the Great Commission and the Great Multitude, we find ourselves facing the world's greatest problem, lostness. Even in the midst of natural disasters, humanitarian crises, and political instability, Southern Baptists send IMB missionaries to give their lives to the lost, living amongst those who have never heard the gospel. People in hard to reach places, people in cities, and those who are dispersed and displaced around the world. At the IMB, we believe that missionary presence cultivates gospel access. Gospel access that knows no geographic or social boundary. We believe that missionary presence fuels gospel belief, and we see the results. We see lives transformed, generations forever changed, and churches planted. Local expressions of the church that take ownership and thrive. God has made our purpose clear. Together, we seek to take the gospel to every nation, to all tribes, to all peoples, to all languages. We don't see places on a map. We see our place in fulfilling the Great Commission. This is our mission. This is your mission. And we are reaching the nations together. When you give toward the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, 100% of your gift goes to help support our missionaries who have been called by God to go to these various places to share the good news of the gospel message. I want to encourage you, if you've not already done that, to pray about what you would give to help spread the good news to those who need to hear it, especially, I was going to say the most, but there's people right next door to you who need to hear it the most as well. And so I hope you'll be a missionary too. Uh, just as a heads up, I've, I've shared with you all that we were looking at the potential of an um, international trip to Romania. I received some information on that this week. We're looking at a trip in March, which means it's coming quickly. I'm going to put out some information this coming week. If you're interested, I would have you contact me. The main purpose of that trip is going to be humanitarian relief, providing, helping to pack food boxes that will go into the Ukraine. And so um, a lot of exciting stuff happening there. We are going to enter into our time of prayer right now. You uh, hopefully have one of these prayer sheets. If not, pick one up. Maybe one of your New Year's resolutions can be, you know what, I want to do more, I want to do better at praying for others. Cora Beth Akers is our person of prayer for this week. Cora Beth is a um, therapist at Lewis Gale Hospital, so that helps you. She's a mom of two boys in elementary school and a daughter to Donnie Johnson. So <laughs> pray, pray, pray. I love you, Donnie. Thank you for allowing us to. Some of you may have received an email um, yesterday. Marshall Dennison, Wally and Kelly Dennison's adult son who was born with cerebral palsy. Marshall has been confined to a wheelchair bed for his entire life. Marshall uh, was taken to the hospital Thursday afternoon, no, Friday. Friday afternoon. Um, diagnosed with pneumonia and RSV. Uh, Friday night was a tough night for Marshall. Um, Wally had shared that things didn't look real good, but then yesterday morning, I say because of prayer, 
things began to turn for Marshall. He's doing a little bit better. Uh, last word I had from Wally yesterday afternoon. But continue to pray for Marshall. Kelly Dennison has been there with him the entire time and uh, want to lift her up as well. I know she's got to be tired, but she's also a um, caregiver for Marshall, always has been and will be. So uh, continue to remember the Dennison family. We have a prayer blanket up here. This prayer blanket, Debbie Rago brought up. It's going to be going to Debbie's daughter-in-law, Carrie Jenkins. Uh, they live in Tennessee, and Carrie is the primary caregiver for her parents. And um, she's struggling right now. Carrie, Carrie's got a lot on her plate. And uh, Debbie was saying she was down there this past week and witnessed that. And, we want to pray that this blanket will provide a sense of comfort and hope for Carrie as she continues to care for uh, her aging parents. Many of you heard that Nancy Epperly went to the hospital on Monday. I've lost track now, Tuesday. Tuesday afternoon, evening. Um, Wednesday had two stents put in to open up a couple of arteries that were blocked. She came home Wednesday. She's doing well, uh, continuing to recover. Still a little sore around um, incision area, but doing well. And if you play pickleball with Nancy, she can't play for two weeks. <laughs> I'm giving you a fair warning. When she comes back, it's going to be like I, rats on crack. I don't know. <laughs> I played pickleball against her before the surgery, so I can't imagine what she's going to She's going to be a beast. Y'all just need to get, get your game on in two weeks because she's coming back. Uh, Judy Deal has had shingles, uh, went, to the hospital, went to the urgent care actually last Sunday on Christmas Day, was diagnosed with shingles. Um, Judy is continuing to do a little bit better, praying that the shingles, they're on her eyelids, we're praying they stay out of her eye. And... Um, so that would be a good prayer request for you on that one. Josephine Powell had foot surgery on um, Monday or Tuesday of this past week. Spoke with Josephine yesterday. She's recovering very well from that. Uh, pain management is one of those things that, again, you could pray for, especially in regard to uh, Josephine. John Huffman. Some of you know Pat and John Huffman. They were coming to Mill Creek for a brief period of time before COVID, and because of John's health concerns, they really have been home um, since COVID. John fell the other day, uh, was taken to Lewis Gale. He has a fractured shoulder right now. They've got John in a sling, a brace to mobilize that. Um, but Pat and John are going to be going at least for 30 days or so. They're from West Virginia. They're going to be going back to that area to an assisted living facility where John can get some help he needs and Pat can get some help she needs right now. She's just worn out um, from, from all that's gone on over the last several years. And so be in prayer for Pat and John. We should have an address for them. If you want to send them a note, um, in the next week or so, we should have an address for them. John is supposed to be released tomorrow, and they'll just go straight to West Virginia. So I asked Pat um, just this morning to make sure that we get their address so you can send them a note of encouragement. Um, many of you have asked about my mom. She's doing very well. Thank you for praying for her. We went up, Josh Witt, my son-in-law and I went up on Monday, this past Monday, and helped my siblings uh, move some of my mom's things into an assisted living apartment um, there in the area, up in the Gainesville, Bristol, Manassas area. And um, she was moved from rehab into that apartment on Wednesday. She's still recovering from her uh, partial hip replacement, but doing pretty well. And we appreciate you continuing to pray for her. I'm sure that you have prayer requests on your hearts and minds here at the beginning of this new year. In just a moment, after we have our offering, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And I would encourage you during this prayer time to either affirm what I'm praying or lift up those things that the Lord lays on your heart, or maybe even just seek the Lord and ask him, what are some things that you need to turn over to him during this prayer time so that you can come to this meal time in a few moments in a more appropriate manner? In a better place with him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. God, at the beginning of this brand new year, not even 11 hours into it, 
Father, what better place could we find ourselves than in your presence in worship? What better way to begin a brand new year than meeting together to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, to look into your word together, to be encouraged here at the beginning of this new year. And so, Father, we pray that we would experience the presence of your spirit in a fresh new way today in this fresh new year. But, Father, we also come before you this morning not only thanking you for a new year as well as the things that we have to celebrate for in this past year. But, Father, we come lifting up those who are on our prayer list, those who are on our hearts and minds, those who could use a special touch of you in this brand new year. Father, I think of Cora Beth Akers and the many roles and hats that she plays in her life. And Father, thank you for her and her family, for what they mean to our church body. And, Lord, we pray that you would encourage her this coming week, especially as our prayer person. Father, I think of those who we mentioned this morning, this blanket that's going to be going to Debbie's daughter-in-law, Carrie. As she cares for her aging parents and the health issues, memory issues, all the things that go along with that, Lord, we pray this blanket would just be a, a source of encouragement for her, that it would help provide a sense of hope and strength as she continues with the various things she has, including caring for parents. So we lay our hands and our hearts, our minds on this blanket and lift her up. <laughs> Father, I think of the Denison family, Marshall, who has been such a joy in my life for all the years I've known him, over 20 years now, Lord. Father, we lift him up and pray that you would strengthen his lungs, that you would clear the pneumonia in the RSV out, and that he will be able to get out of the hospital and back home where he's comfortable and familiar surroundings. But Lord, in the meantime, help him to get the rest he needs and his mom, Kelly, to get the rest she needs as she continues to care for him, even there in the hospital. Be with them, Lord. For those, Father, who've experienced recent setbacks like Nancy and Judy and Josephine and Others, Lord, who are on our hearts and minds, we lift them up to you and pray for healing in their bodies, healing from procedures, healing from shingles, healing from cancer. Lord, I think of Sue and her radiation treatments and lift her up to you. Father, thank you for the encouragement she is and for the ways in which she sees your hand at work, even through cancer treatments in her life. Lord, bless her in this new year. Father, for John Huffman and for Pat, as John's in the hospital, as they're preparing to at least transition temporarily into an assisted living facility, Lord, we pray for them. And God, that you would continue to bring people across their paths that can help them with their various needs. Lord, I think of our missionaries who are serving internationally, who don't just need our prayers and our encouragement, they also need some financial help. And so, Lord, as we give and prepare to wrap up our Lottie Moon offering, Lord, we pray that you would bless the offering that is being sent, that others would come to know you as their personal Savior through the witness and lives of these missionaries. And, Lord, as we prepare to give now on this new year, a new day, that, Father, you would bless the offering that we give. Lord, that it would help to meet needs here in our community as well as abroad. Father, we thank you for the faithful stewardship of your people and how over the years they've been faithful and continue to be, even at the beginning of this new one. So bless the offering that we give as we give it back to you, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Jacob and Marsha, for that. You know, as I thought about today and the beginning of a new year, what better way to start than by celebrating the Lord's Supper together? This meal serves as a reminder for us of what Christ did on the cross, but it also, in some ways, serves as a covenant that we're making. By receiving these elements, we're saying, God, I believe in you. God, I trust you. God, here at the beginning of this brand new year, I'm choosing to follow you. And so as you prepare to receive these elements, I hope that you'll consider some of those meetings as you come forward to receive it. Let me invite the deacons who are going to be helping to serve to come up at this time. And as they are, in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to get up from where you are to come down the center aisle across the front. They'll hand you these elements that are prepackaged. And then go across the front and back down the side aisles to return to your seats. If you're sitting near someone who maybe has some mobility issues, maybe you could just let them know, you know what, let me serve you. Let me bring it to you today as you come to receive these elements, as we come as a body of believers to share. If you're a Christ follower, you don't have to be a member of Mill Creek. You just have to have invited Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and to participate in this reminder meal for us. Lord Jesus, as we prepare to receive these elements, speak to our hearts. Father, open up our hearts and call us out on those areas we've yet to confess so that maybe even as we are in the process of receiving these elements, we'll take the time to confess those things so we can approach this new moment this year in a fresh new perspective of you and what you did for us. Bless us as we receive this meal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to begin making your way down to receive these elements. the night that Jesus gathered with his disciples to share this Passover meal together. These elements were present there at the table. Scripture lets us know that Jesus took bread that was there. He blessed it. He gave thanks for it and then shared it with his disciples. Would you pray with us as we bless and give thanks for this bread? Lord, we stand amazed that you, the great creator, would give your body for
And after blessing it, he gave it to his disciples and said, as often as you eat of this bread, eat it in remembrance of me. Also at the table was a cup of wine, and scripture lets us know that in like fashion, Jesus took and blessed and gave thanks for it. So again, would you pray with us? Lord, again this morning, we thank you for this time that you allowed us to come together to tell the plain truth, God. As we look back, everybody wants to be number one. So who's going to be number one today in our group here this morning? said as often as you drink of this cup in the future, drink it in remembrance of my blood shed for you. God, we do thank you for the gift of your son that we celebrated last week and now we remember the sacrifice made this week. Bless us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, take your Bibles this morning and open them up to Matthew chapter 2. On Christmas Eve, I said we were going to finish this story today. And so here we are, Matthew chapter 2, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12. And the story of the wise men who went to visit the Christ child. But here we are, too. It's a, one of those unique times in history. It's not going to happen again for 11 more years. So I'm glad you're here this morning to celebrate New Year's Day in worship. But we're here at the beginning of this brand new year. And I wonder, have you thought at all about what you would like to see in 2023? What is it you would like to see happen in your life this year? What are some things maybe you would like to accomplish? Maybe you set some resolutions. Maybe you didn't. But who would you like to be at the end of this year? 364 and three-quarter days from now? Who do you want to be? I'm sure you've heard the old adage, to fail to plan is a plan to fail. Or, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. So what are you shooting for here in this brand new year? Have you considered what you might want to accomplish? What is it that you're looking for this year? I mean, think back to a year ago. What did you hope for in 2022? Now that year is done. Did you find what you were looking for last year? It was 1987. The band U2 came out with their hit song, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For. Man, here we are, 30-some years later. I wonder if they found it yet. I don't think so, because I saw Sing 2 recently, and they're still singing about it. Have you found what you're looking for? The song is about someone on a journey seeking something. We're really never clued into what it is they're seeking. We do see the various places that they've looked. But we really don't know what they're looking for. We just know they still haven't found it. I was thinking about this over the last couple of days. Debbie and I made a trip to Edenton, North Carolina on Friday and then returned yesterday. Having never been to Edenton, I didn't have a clue how to get there. So what did I use? No. <laughs> uh, my GPS. My ways. We pulled it up. We punched in the address for our final destination in Edenton. We were going down to see Debbie's younger brother, his wife, and Debbie's mom and sister and some family members, and we hadn't seen them for a while. This was a new house, a new-to-them house, and so we wanted to go. And as we traveled, and as I used my ways, my GPS, and having already prepared for this message, I, I began to think about what it was like for the wise men, what that journey would have been like for them, 
and I came back with all these new thoughts to put into my message last night. And when I pulled up Microsoft Word, when I pulled up my message for today, it gave me a message. It said, you no longer have access to Word. Would you like to use a different account? It's the only account I know of, so here we go. The, the, the wise men were on a journey to discover God in their life. And I thought about how we are on a journey, hopefully looking for God in our own lives. And as we begin this new year, I think we can learn a valuable lesson from the wise men, a valuable lesson that Debbie and I experienced through GPS, a lesson in which, unlike you two, we did find what we were looking for. The wise men found the king they were searching for. Debbie and I found our destination and made it back safe and sound. And so what are you looking for this year? Follow along with me in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler." who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them and till it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route." We don't know a whole lot about these wise men, these magi that Matthew talks about. But we do know where they came from. We know they came from the east. Chances are they possibly came from around the Babylon area. Babylon was about 900 miles away from Jerusalem. But it was also known for being the center of stargazing. The Babylonians were into the stars in astrology and astronomy, and they tried to discover the mysteries of the universe through it. And so chances are maybe these wise men came from over 900 miles away in the area in Babylon or surrounding it. Remember, a lot of Israelites have been taken captive from Jerusalem to Babylon, And they would have taken their hope for the coming Messiah along with them. They also would have been taking parts of Scripture that we refer to as the Old Testament. But they would have had parts of the Old Testament at that time that they would have carried with them. And so as astronomers, these wise men must have read everything they could get their hands on just to better understand their occupation, to better understand what they were doing. And in their studies, certainly they would have heard or they would have read about the coming Messiah. They would have seen in the Mosaic, <clears throat> in the Mosaic Law, in the book of Numbers, that this star had been talked about, a reference had been made to it in Balaam's prophecy. So we know from verses 1 and 2 where they came from. We also know when they came and what they came looking for. Scripture tells us it was 
after Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. It was during the reign of King Herod. Well, we know from history outside of Scripture, the historical records and documents, we know that Herod the Great reigned from 75 B.C., 75 years before the birth of Christ, to somewhere around 4 A.D. And so Herod was ruling at the time that Christ was born. Anyone, including Herod's family, Herod looked at as the enemy. I mean, Herod was a cruel man. He didn't allow anyone, including his family, to interrupt his reign or his rule. Again, history lets us know that he was a ruthless murderer. He had his wife killed. He had two of her brothers killed. He had his own children killed because he saw them as a threat to his throne. And so Herod was a very not nice guy when you stop to think about it. But we know when he reigned. Verse 2 tells us the Magi arrived in Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. That title, king of the Jews, that they used for Jesus would have put Herod on high alert. And unlike, again, the person depicted in u two song, the Magi's journey did end, finding what they were looking for, seeking God, searching for, finding Him, is what every beating heart is looking for. I shared in our sermon series leading up to Christmas that God has placed within us a desire to know Him, and that place can only be filled by a relationship with Him. But because that place is there, it puts us on a journey to discover Him. And until we find Him in a relationship with Him, we're not at rest. The wise men may have arrived after Jesus was born, but don't miss an important truth in verse 2 right there. They said, we saw His star. And have come. They didn't say they were looking for the one who would become king. They said they were looking for the one who is king, the newborn king. The wise men knew exactly who they were looking for. Their experience is a good lesson for us in finding and in following, I think. God's will, God's plans for our life. And so what better way to begin a new year than to consider, God, how can I discover your will? God, how can I follow your will for my life here in this brand new year? I think if you'll apply some of the lessons from the wise men into your life, you'll be well on your way to finding what you're looking for this year, to finding what you're seeking in 2023. And so let me just give you a few of the things that came to my mind. Discovering God's will begins as we understand that God wants to lead us, but not overwhelm us. When we left Friday morning from Blue Ridge heading to Edenton, North Carolina, I'd looked at a map. I knew that Edenton was on the eastern side of North Carolina. It was somewhere near Nags Head and the Outer Banks. As a matter of fact, the Edenton is part of the Albemarle Sound, feeds right into the ocean. And so I knew about where I was. I've been to Nags Head a number of times. I know how to get to Nags Head. But I didn't know how to get to Edenton or to Debbie's brother's home. And so what did we do? We punched in his address into ways. And that lovely voice came out of the car and said, head straight on Michaela Drive for 800 and however many feet it was. And so I did that. I can't tell you how many turns we made from our first left off of Michaela on to West. I can tell you this. If that little voice in Waze had said, you're going to turn left onto Michaela, you're going to turn left onto Zimmerman, you're going to turn right onto Archway, you're going to turn right onto 460 heading east toward Lynchburg, you're going to go through Appomattox, you're going to blah, 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 blah. I never would have made it. I would have been overwhelmed. I needed one step at a time. The wise men began their search with one piece of information. 
they saw a star. They saw his star. It had risen, and they knew that star indicated that a new king of the Jews had been born. And so what did they do? They packed their proverbial bags on their camels, and they set out to figure out where this king was. Now, we may not have a miraculous star of God guiding us every day of our life, but I can tell you, when you invite Jesus Christ into your heart, you do have the presence of His Spirit, the Holy Spirit that takes up residence within you, and that Holy Spirit has been promised as a guide for you. And so you don't have a star, but you do have God Himself living in you. Sometimes, when we're seeking God's will for our life, His Spirit like the star, only gives us enough light for that first step. Or it only gives us enough light for that next step. Typically, the Holy Spirit does not reveal our whole journey all at one time. I've come to realize that when God only gives me one piece of information, it's because I probably would be overwhelmed if He showed me the entire picture. I've shared this with y'all before. If in 1987, when God first began calling me toward ministry, if he had shown me that one day I'd be the senior pastor at Mill Creek, y'all, I'd still be doing air conditioning heating work. Because that would have just been an overwhelming thing for me. But he gave me one step at a time. Sometimes we think we need to understand the bigger picture before we begin following His will. So what do we do? We get that first direction, and then we sit and we wait for the next one. And we're hoping that He's going to give us more pieces of the puzzle before we ever begin the journey. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to begin to follow with the first instruction we get. If I had waited just in the driveway, waiting for ways to give me the next piece of information, we'd have still been waiting. We need to get up. We need to get moving in the direction that the Holy Spirit points us. And so a question to consider when you're trying to follow God's will in your life this year is simply this. What can or should I do based on the information the Holy Spirit has given me? I may not have the whole picture, but the Holy Spirit has given me some marching orders Or a marching order. So what can or should I do based on the information that I have? If the Magi were told, I I think, because if you read down into the next portion of Scripture, you see that Joseph and Mary and Jesus escaped to Egypt and why they escaped because of the slaughter of the innocent and all of these things that happened. But I, I have a feeling that the wise men, wise as they were, were probably a lot like you and me. And if God has said, look, here's the deal. I want you to follow this star. And by the way, the star is going to lead you to Herod. Here's what's going to happen. Then you're going to go see Jesus. And oh, by the way, because you go see Herod, there's going to be a lot of babies slaughtered and killed. Innocent babies, lives who are going to be taken as a result of your visit to Herod. But hey, I need you to stay focused here. I need you to go to Herod. If God had laid all that out to the wise men, my guess is they'd be like me. They'd say, you know what, God? Thanks. I appreciate the offer, but I'm out. That's too much for me to handle. That's too much for me to bear. That's too much for me to go through. And so God doesn't operate that way. He gives us a step or two at a time, just enough light to get us to that next part of the journey. Taking the information God has given you and beginning the journey is why it's called a step of faith. You step out in faith. I don't don't know what the next step is, but I know I'm going to take this one, and then I'm going to take that one. it's It's a walk of faith in our journey with Christ. What's in front of us is typically all we can handle at the moment. As I thought about that, I thought about the story of Abraham in Genesis. You know, God told Abraham, I want you to pack up your belongings, I want you to pack up everything that you have, and I want you to set out for a destination I will show you. He didn't say, here's where you're headed. I want you to just begin the journey. I will show you where to go, but I want you to be obedient. I want you to step out in faith and begin the process. If God had given him the entire picture of what all the ups and downs that Abraham and Sarah would experience on their journey, he probably would have decided to stay where he was. But instead, like the Magi, in faith, based on the information he had, Abraham 
began the journey towards God's will for his life. Can I say thank you to some of you Mill Creek folks who hung in there? As I thought about this, I thought about, you know what, eight years ago, if God had revealed to you all of the ups and downs you would experience in the journey to get to where we are today, some of you probably would have said, peace out, God. I'm going to find me another church where I don't have to go through all that. I'm going to find a place where everything is, is rolling along. I, I don't want to have to go through all that, God. As a church, we don't want to have to go through all that, God. As a, and so what did he do? He just had you in faith continue taking a step at a time. So for all of those of you who hung in there, thank you. We're experiencing some wonderful times right now as a church family. And a lot of that's because you hung in there and were faithful. And so thank you for that. If you want to find and follow God's will for your life this year, ask, what can I do? What should I do based on the information that God has given me? And then follow that question up by asking, God, what's my next step? Okay, God, you're leading me to participate in this ministry. Okay, God, you're calling me to do this or to do that. Okay, God, here we go. Now, what's the next step, God? What can or should I do? And then, God, what's next? Because the picture is not going to be complete if all you do is take the first step. Trust God with the roadmap. He'll give you the next turn. But also understand this. There will be times where God will seem silent in the journey. But he hasn't left you. As I said, Waze, GPS, gives me a turn-by-turn -turn instructions. There were long periods of time where I drove without knowing what was coming next. I drove waiting for the next instruction. I didn't stop. I didn't pull over. There were a couple times where I said, Debbie, check it. Are we still on the right path? But long periods of silence in the journey the other day. The long periods of silence didn't mean that the little voice inside of Waze got tired of guiding me. It didn't mean that Waze didn't want to go where I wanted to go. It didn't mean that it had turned itself off and said, you know what, buddy, you're on your own. Take it from here and see if you can make it. And then if you can't, come back and thank me and we'll start this again. It never did anything like that. I was simply heading the right direction, and it didn't need to tell me anything until it was time to do something else. When we read this story, we get the same sense. As it, the more I look at this story, the more I think, you know what? I think the star rose. I think it got the wise men's attention, and I think it went away for a period of time. Here's why I say that. Before some of y'all go, I ain't listening to you no more. <laughs> when the Magi spoke with Herod, Herod didn't say star. Come here, show, come here, show me what star you're talking about. What, what, what star? Herod didn't ask any information about it except one. When did that appear? I have a feeling that Herod, I have a feeling that Jerusalem may not have even seen the star. Why? Because sometimes God reveals something to you that he doesn't reveal to everybody else. Your journey is not everybody else's journey. And I think God showed the wise men the star to get them going. And they're thinking, hey, it's the star, it's his star, it's the king of the Jews, we got to go. Well, where are we going? Well, I guess Jerusalem. It's the capital city of the Israelites, so let's go to Jerusalem. I don't know that that's what happened, but I do think, and here's why, I do think the star vanished for a while. Because you get to verse 9 and 10, and verses 9 and 10 tell us that when the Magi left Jerusalem, the star appeared 
and they were overjoyed. As you're seeking God's will for your life, understand that there may be times where God goes silent and you feel like he's ghosted you. If you want to know what I just said, talk to somebody that's around 23 years old. <laughs> that just means God went silent. <laughs> you feel like God ghosted you. You feel like God went in silent mode. But don't get discouraged by his silence. It doesn't, it doesn't happen all the time, but it's also not uncommon in our relationship with him. There were times in which there were years between the moment when God told Abraham to pack up and begin the journey, there were years between that and the next time that God showed up and spoke with Abraham, confirming that covenant, confirming he was on the right path, or telling him what to do next. Sometimes we get impatient. <laughs> we think, well, God hasn't said nothing lately, so I think he needs my help. God, because we, we get tired of waiting on him to move, we get in our own mindset and we do what we think we should versus going back to him versus going to our co-pilot, the Holy Spirit, and saying, hey, are we still on the right path here? Are we still headed the right direction? Sometimes we get impatient when we think God's been silent. I knew Edenton was on the eastern side of North Carolina, close to Nags Head, and there was a point where I was going down 460 where Way said I needed to turn right in two miles. So I'm not even to Windsor and Ivor yet. I'm not turning right. What's the matter with you? You don't know. So what did I do, Debbie? I kept going the way I thought I should go. Fortunately, when it recalculated, when it caught up with me, it only altered our trip by a little bit. So only a little bit on this one. Abraham did the same thing. God said, I know you're old. I know your wife's barren. I know you don't have children, but I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. How can I be the father of a great nation when we don't have children? My wife is barren. We're old. Her womb is closed. God, um, hmm. But God had given them this covenant. God had made this promise with them. They had begun this journey with God. And so what did they, they got to a place where Abraham and Sarah decided, you know, may, maybe what you're supposed to do is have a child with my maidservant, Hagar. They took things into the matters into their own hands. Rather than trusting God, rather than continuing in the direction God had determined for them they took matters into their own hands god may have been silent but he had things under control abraham just needed to trust and keep doing what he was already doing when seeking to follow god's will we can get tired we can get frustrated thinking that god's ghosted us that he's forgotten about us that he's not doing something or showing us what's next it's like we need constant affirmation and encouragement that's why there were a couple of times in those long stretches where I said, Debbie, look, make sure we're still heading the right direction. I needed to know. We worry that we're going to miss the next turn on our faith journey. But times like this require us to be patient and to trust God, believing that he's put me in this journey. I just need to continue moving forward. As long as we're paying attention to the prompting of His Spirit, He'll let us know when it's time to change. He'll let us know when it's time to turn. He'll let us know what to do next. If you're following God's will for your life and there's no clear direction from Him to change direction, then just keep heading the direction you're going until He says, whoa, 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 or turn left or turn right. God doesn't usually give us con constant reminders. He points us in the direction and then he may go silent until the next turn. Just assume that God wants you to keep going, to keep doing what you're doing until you hear otherwise. Because I can tell you this. Above all, you need to understand that God wants you to succeed in finding his will for your life this year. 
I had to believe the GPS wanted us to get to our destination safe and sound. It even asked me. It showed me a couple different routes, gave me options. I picked the quickest. Didn't work out to be the quickest, but that's my fault. But the GPS wanted to get me to where I wanted to go. There were times, even when GPS gave me a warning, traffic alert ahead, police alert ahead, car on the shoulder ahead. It was trying to get us there as quickly and as safely as it could possibly get us there. But God's not trying to hide things from you. He's not trying to keep his will or his plans for your life secret and private. He doesn't want to play this big cosmic game of hide and seek with you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to discover it. We saw a couple weeks ago, he's our everlasting father. He cares more for you than anybody else could possibly care for you. He's not going to play this cosmic game of hide and seek, hoping you discover your will, his will for your life this year. I don't think God removed the star from the sky for a period of time to throw the wise men off, to make their lives difficult. He did it because he needed them to go to Jerusalem first. That was part of his plan. It was part of the bigger picture. And as soon as that part of the journey was over, God made the star visible again. Not just visible, put it right smack dab over the house where they could find the king they're looking for. Sometimes we go through a period of silence because we need time to grow. We need time to mature before we're ready for what God has for us next. For me, it was years in student ministry, a couple of years as an associate pastor before God had this for me now. It was a maturation process, seasons in my life. But understand the maturation process is part of God's success plan for your life. Thinking back to Abraham, there came a point in which God delivered on his promise. In Genesis 21, 1 and 2, we read, Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time, at the very time, at the very time, Scripture says, that God had promised him. God's timing is typically not our timing, but his timing is always perfect timing. As I thought about timing and God's timing and sometimes having to wait and feel like he's ghosted us or whatever, my mind went back to times where I've called customer service and been placed on hold. I'll put it on speakerphone just so that I can multitask. There have been times I've been on hold 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. There have been times I've been on hold for long periods of time and I needed to go to the bathroom. But I was afraid. I was afraid if I walked away and went to the bathroom, the customer service agent would come on at that very moment. Hello, how can I help you? Hello? Hello? Oh, nobody's there. Click. Oh, another eternity waiting. God doesn't do that to us. He's not playing that kind of game with us. He doesn't go, well, you missed your chance. Good luck on your own. Hope you can be successful. Look at what happened in verse 11. After the star reappeared, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. They bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures, presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They began their journey looking for this king. They didn't find him where they thought they would find him in Jerusalem, but Jerusalem was part of God's plan. But they did find him. God's plans for your life are perfect even when you can't see the whole picture, even when you don't know the whole process. I can tell you, though, that worship is part of that plan. I can tell you staying connected with God through personal worship in a daily quiet time as well as corporate worship is part of that plan. We discover more about who God is and what he intends for our lives in moments just like that. And the best gift you can give is the gift of yourself in that relationship. And what happens when you do? I think the same thing that happens to the wise men in verse 12. Having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they return to their country by another route. When we discover God's will for our life, we can't help but go home different. When we experience God in moments of worship, we can't help but leave changed. 
We can't help but be a different person as a result of that encounter. And so we go home different. God wants you to discover his will for your life. God wants you to experience him in 2023. He wants you to find what you're looking for in him. And when you do, you can't help but be changed as a result. If you're going to find what you're looking for this year, understand right here at the beginning that God wants to lead you to it, but he doesn't want to overwhelm you in the process. He may go silent for a while, but he hasn't left you. Just keep going until you hear from his spirit about the next step that he wants you to take. And above all, know that he's your everlasting father. He wants you to be successful in finding his will for your life. Because when you have purpose and meaning, life is complete. If you'll do this at the end of 2023, I can guarantee you too may still be looking, but you won't be. God, thank you for this reminder from the wise men on how we can discover your plan for our life and how you call us to continue in that journey no matter what we experience, knowing that your plan is the best thing we could ever experience. Being in the center of your will is the best place we could ever be. So, Father, on the beginning of this new year, on this first day, in this first morning, encourage us to seek you, not just the newborn king, but the king of kings and lord of lords in whose name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to know more about what a relationship with Jesus looks like, I'd love to have that conversation with you. We're going to close this hour of worship out by allowing you an opportunity to respond. Maybe that response is a first-time decision to ask Jesus into your heart. Love to have that conversation with you. If you're online, connect with me. Maybe you're sitting here and you're going, you know what? I hadn't really thought much about a resolution. I hadn't really thought much. It's just a brand new year. I, was, I, was, I got to, well, you don't even have to remember to write 2023 on your checks anymore if you do everything electronically. I don't have to do much. Maybe you do. Maybe God's calling you out saying, you know what? I've got plans. I've got purposes. You haven't even, just, you haven't even asked me about yet. And in the quiet of this moment as we sing, you just want to turn that over to him. Maybe you'd like to know more about becoming part of the Mill Creek family as together we continue to serve, to seek his will. We're going to be entering into a strategic time of planning this year. I've already asked the staff for some names of people who they think would be great on a strategic team. I'm going to be asking our um, ad administrative team and our mission and ministry team for names, and we're going to put together a team. We're ready to take what we began before COVID shut us down and begin and, and get into that process of God. Who are you calling us to be and where are you calling us to go as we continue to move forward with your journey for Mill Creek and for us? I'm excited about what this year holds in front of us. I hope you are too. As we stand and close this hour of worship out, this song is an opportunity for you to worship one more time. It's an opportunity for you to respond if the Spirit's leading you to do that. Whichever it is, let's stand and worship together. The cross upon which Jesus died Is a shelter in which we can hide And it's grace so free Is sufficient for me And deep is its fountain As wide
Fathers, we prepare to leave your presence in this sanctuary. We don't leave you behind. You go with us through the presence of your spirit, guiding us each moment of every day of our lives. So, Father, as we head out into a new year, but an old world that's still confused, an old world that's still seeking you, Father, for those of us who have found you, use us. Use us to be a catalyst to help others come to know you this year. So we leave here with the assurance of our salvation and the hope that we have in eternity and the knowledge that you are going to see us through every moment that we experience in 2023 as we seek you first. In whose name we pray. Amen. Please join happy me as we sing Bless Me the Tie. Bless me.